So it's a great pleasure to talk to you about um, CERN and open hardware. And I want to start by thanking the organizers for going virtual in such a short time and providing us uh, with the opportunity to share all these uh, great uh, talks. I was very interested in the previous talks and I, I will stay here for the whole day. So hanging out in the Discord. Um, okay, so uh, for those of you uh, who don't know what CERN is. CERN is the European Laboratory for Particle Physics, and our main mission is to um, uh, conduct research on the fundamental constituents of matter and uh, their interactions. So finding out more about how nature works. And we do that uh, by smashing protons at high energy uh, against one another and seeing what comes out. With the help of particle accelerators, you can see here uh, the network of accelerators. The largest one is the LHC. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider, and uh, uh, in four points uh, in the LHC, particles are made to collide, and around those points we have detectors, which are huge endeavors, huge collaborations of physicists, which are the size of cathedrals, and uh, uh, they are 100 meters underground. They take all the data that comes out of the collisions and log it for offline analysis. Now, a lesser part, uh, a lesser, a lesser known part of the mandate of CERN is that not only we should conduct research, but we should make it available freely. And uh, there is this very nice document called the CERN Convention, which is a founding document of CERN, which was uh, drafted in the 50s by idealistic people after the World War and says, among other things, that the results of research should, may, should be made generally available. In other places in the convention, it also says that stuff we make uh, on the quest to these discoveries should also be made available. And that is why for people uh, working at CERN, uh, there is this question of how we should interpret that beautiful mandate in the technological scene of the 21st century. And, and people have found that open source is very efficient at, uh, at uh, making sure um, our developments have an impact. For example, people in the publication sector uh, have found that open access is great to make sure everybody can read articles. Uh, people who are in charge of data sets from experiments have found that open data makes sure that uh, results are reproducible and transparent. Uh, CERN, of course, has a long tradition of contributing to free and open source software projects, and some of us in the uh, hardware development part uh, have found that open hardware is a very efficient way of making sure our developments have a, a, an impact beyond CERN. And uh, one thing that makes us very proud is that all these forms of sharing uh, depend on an underlying technology that was developed at CERN at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s of the last century, which is the World Wide Web. So when we started doing uh, open hardware at CERN, we were confronted with a number of challenges. And uh, uh, the first one, which is it's easy to do today, just to put your, start, to put your stuff online, uh, we, we needed a place to share the designs on the web. So we created the open hardware repository, which is currently hosting more than 300 designs. Another thing we had to do is discuss with companies with whom we had had a proprietary um, relationships up to then and convincing them that they could make money with open source hardware. Uh, so, so there was always this false dichotomy between is it open or is it commercial? And, and we had to dispel this myth and tell them that commercial is the opposite of non-commercial, open is the opposite of proprietary, and therefore it's a two-dimensional problem with four possibilities. And we believe that the winning combination is open and commercial because you get the best of both worlds. You get commercial support and uh, you don't have any vendor lock-in situations. I just wanted to show you one of our developments um, uh, that we open source and we're very happy with. It's a technology which is uh, an evolution or an extension of Ethernet. It's called White Rabbit. Uh, so everything you can do with Ethernet, you can do with White Rabbit. We designed a switch, a White Rabbit switch from scratch. It's all open hardware, uh, gateway, and uh, software. And uh, there's also uh, an example, White Rabbit node. Uh, White Rabbit adds to Ethernet a number of features. And one of them is that you can get synchronized in time by plugging a White Rabbit node to any part of a network, irrespectively of number of hops through switches, uh, fiber length. You get synchronized to within one nanosecond or better, so to within one billionth of a second. And uh, this is, of course, very useful for us uh, because we do a lot of um, highly distributed real-time uh, controls and data acquisition. And it came as, as no surprise that it's also very useful for other scientific experiments like telescopes. 
Uh, and then through the magic of open source, people found that it was useful in other places beyond science. Uh, for example, for distributing electrical energy through smart grids, you know, this modern way of distributing and orchestrating the transfer of energy with many producers, many consumers, uh, synchronizing mobile base stations or time stamping financial transactions uh, for, uh, this is a legal requirement in, in most countries to, uh, to, to see what went wrong if something went wrong at some moment and, and do a uh, after the fact analysis. Uh, we also standardized White Rabbit under right IEEE 1588, which was quite an effort, but it was uh, worthwhile in my opinion. Uh, you know, there's a bit of tension sometimes between standardization and open source, and we're very happy we walked that path because that means many people, many more people will be using it and uh, it'll have a bigger impact. Okay, uh, as Michael said, um, we just published the version two of the license and I want to say a few words about it. So this is something that we identified as a, as a need from very early on when we work with companies, companies fear uh, legal uncertainty and they wanted to know what they were getting into. So we drafted the CERN open hardware license version one, then 1.1, then 1.2, and then there was a, a gap because it took us quite a number of years actually to prepare V2, even if we were from early on conscious that V1.2 had some shortcomings we wanted to fix. Now, what's new in V2? Um, there are three variants to cater for different collaborative models. I will I will describe graphically what those variants mean. There are two reciprocal variants and one permissive one. We also, for the reciprocal ones, we wanted to manage the scope. You know, when you have to, uh, the, the share back uh, clauses, you have to make sure that the scope is very well delimited. So for example, if you're designing a PCB and uh, you have a resistor on that PCB, uh, you, you could legitimately ask if you have to provide the recipe to make the resistor out of carbon and metal. Uh, so we have this notion of available components, components which are available to everybody. You don't need to disclose the recipe. Uh, going up, also the scope has to be delimited. If I have a, a PCB designed for a mouse, uh, if I connect the mouse to a laptop, do I need to also give the um, uh, schematics for the laptop? And th that's uh, where the notion of product helps us to make sure that the, uh, the product is what gets made with the schematics and that's where the obligation stops. And then we also have external material for the weekly reciprocal variant for the stuff that's proprietary and can be freely interfaced to, uh, to open source design. We also added a retaliation clause to the patent license. This is a very important part of hardware licenses, um, when I, uh, the patent license. So when I give you a design, I also promise you I will not sue you for patent infringement. This is very important. Now we added a complementary clause which says that if you sue me for patent infringement, then you lose your rights uh, given in the license. Another very important development is it now works for HDL. At the time of the publication of version 1.2, I thought that GPL and LGPL could be good reciprocal licenses for hardware description language and FPGA work and ASIC design. I don't believe that anymore. And uh, we took the opportunity uh, of the V2 for publication to, to, uh, to give the world a, a good reciprocal uh, licensing scheme for HDL. Um, and then something very important, we want to emulate these copyleft um, uh, behaviors that come from software, these great things that when you get a binary, you get access to the sources. In the hardware world, that means that when you get an object, you should be able to find the design of that object. So one of the things we did is uh, protect uh, notices imprinted on objects. So you can imprint, like for example, a URL, and this will stay there irrespectively of how many hands uh, the object has gone through to the end recipient. So he or she can find the design back. And then some people infringe the license unknowingly, and it's a pity, uh, but uh, we, we came up with a grace period of 30 days. So after notification, they ha still have 30 days to change their behavior without losing their rights. So very, very quickly, uh, the variants. Uh, so if you have an HCL file, for example, which is covered under CERN OHL in the upper uh, left corner, and you have your project, you embed your file in the project, and depending on the licensing option, if you had strongly reciprocal, then the whole project has to be disclosed. If you had weakly reciprocal, uh, only the part that was covered by, by CERN OHL has to be disclosed, plus any modifications to it. And if you're under the permissive variant, nothing has to be disclosed. Uh, same thing for PCBs and any other hardware for that matter. So here's a bit of schematics and layout represented by uh, the uh, contents of these um, dashed red line boxes uh, in the project and exactly the same applies as before. Uh, disclose the whole project, only the covered part uh, or not, nothing at all if you're in permissive uh, under, under the permissive variant. 
So uh, if you have a PCB, this is the way uh, to share it with the world. You you go to your silk, silk screen layer and you add a notice saying, here's my copyright and I license this under the CERN OHL with dash variant version 2.0 and the URL to the license text. Uh, and um, it's all great, except there's a little problem uh, with the sharing. Those of you who use this layout tool will know will notice that it's a it's a proprietary tool. And I, I would like to uh, 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 put a debate on the table uh, and um, uh, to to explain to you why I think that this is a much better situation. So this is actually a layout done in KiCad, which is one of the freely available open source tools for doing circuit design. Um, and, and, and for me, this is quite an important um, uh, thing that we should fix all together, starting with the big companies that are the trendsetters in the open source hardware world. Because of course, by putting stuff on the web, they invite others to get a license for the proprietary tools that they might have used to, to see the designs and to edit them. Now, uh, I have discussed with some people in the community and uh, there was always this possibility of um, of saying, okay, we can have interchangeable formats, and then it wouldn't matter what tool you use. Uh, it's a bit, you know, in analogy with what happens in the software world. The memory representation of text files, the format, is well defined. The C standard tells you what C code you can use, so you can put your C files on the web, and anybody can get them with any proprietary or open source editor, and that just works. There are technical and non-technical reasons in, in the PCB design world why that wouldn't work. Uh, I, I have just chosen to illustrate this with two examples. This is, by the way, nothing. there's nothing wrong with these companies I'm mentioning. This is just to illustrate that there are very legitimate reasons uh, why uh, the, the import-export approach would not quite work, at least today, and probably not in the future either. So. Uh, here's a, a bit of layout from Eagle, and Eagle has uh, different shapes, supports different shapes for vias, uh, and other tools like KiCad and others only support round vias. So uh, exporting from Eagle to KiCad will lose that information. And there is no standard that says what features are supported, uh, unlike in the C or in the, in, in the software world. So this is a technical reason. And then there are non-technical reasons which are also very legitimate. For example, here's a, you know, Altium files are, are Microsoft compound uh, files where you can open and inside there's structure with directories and files. And, and you can see that the contents of what you get in Altium Designer are uh, relatively easy to interpret. What you get in Circuit Studio is obfuscated, and, and more importantly, you cannot open a, an Altium Designer uh, design file from Circuit Studio, which is a very legitimate decision from Altium. You shouldn't be able to uh, to, to open the uh, expensive uh, the, uh, uh, the the design done with expensive tool with a cheap tool. Uh, so this is just to say that. Uh, it would be much simpler if we all chose to contribute to open source tools and we started using these for sharing designs. Okay, and uh, to finish, I just wanted to put on the table uh, another question, which is, should public institutions have a special role in open source hardware? Uh, I believe so, and I have written about the subject. I will give a link later and I will answer questions in the, in the, in the chat. Um, I think so because our mandates are very, very nicely aligned with the ethos of open source. And uh, because we have seen at CERN that with relatively modest means, we have had quite an impact so far with the license, with our contributions to KiCad development for the last 10 plus years yeah. and with other developments. And we think with the amount of public institutions out there that if there were a bit more of coordination, um, uh, things could be really fantastic. And I think uh, Oshua could play a role in there. So uh, I'm eager to discuss that. So I wanted to finish by giving you some links in case you're interested uh, in getting more information. Um, there's the Open Hardware Repository, everything about the license. We are organizing KeyCon 2020 at CERN, hopefully in September. Hopefully we are past the crisis and, and we can do this in person. We're very excited about it. And, and uh, we're working on an essay of why public institutions should publish more of their designs as open source hardware. Thank you.